Welcome to Revolution Road with the Journal of the American Revolution. Nancy Spanos, um, by the way, um, in 2019, she followed up the work I told you about earlier that she was doing uh, on economic ideas, uh, Alexander Hamilton's economic ideas that she'd been studying since the 70s. She followed that up with a book on Hamilton himself and his role in building the American economic success. It's called Hamilton versus Wall Street, the core principles of the American system of economics, and it's available through all Internet book outlets. Um, it's great to have Nancy on the show. She joins us for Revolution. Revolution Road. I think it's really great, too, that she joins us on the day that the uh, U.S. Treasury was founded. Hey, Nancy, how about that? That's some uh, synergy right there, huh? Yeah, it certainly is. I mean, I tend not to think of that day. I think of September 11th when Hamilton was actually a, took office. But that's uh, my particular uh, concentration was is on the man, I guess, you know, yeah. and his ideas. So let's talk a little bit about Hamilton. Uh, there has been so much, you know, along with, I was talking about Chernow earlier, along with um, the kind of revitalization of U.S. Grant, there are two figures, Grant being one and Hamilton being even larger than that, who have gotten a real kind of second look, third look, remarkable third act in American life in regards to their regard and their place in history. But your obsession with this uh, particular individual goes back to the 70s. Can you tell us about the adventure, your own intellectual adventure into the world of Alexander Hamilton? Yes, I certainly can, uh, because it was quite a revelation to me. I'd taken Economics 101 in uh, college, and... Uh, you know, economics was being presented as this really dismal science, you know, of the question of profit and loss and, you know, what your curves are and so forth and so on. And when I read, uh, my introduction really that hooked me on Hamilton was from the Report on Manufacturers, which is his major work. And many people don't read it. It's 30,000 words, you know, but it has everything uh, that you have to start with for the American system of economics, you know, and it, it has theory, what produces wealth, it has what the government needs to do with public credit, the essential role of public credit, the essential requirement to, that we, as, that we protect our political independence, our military independence with economic independence, by providing all the essentials for our people to live and to thrive. And then he has detailed plans, including a whole a little section on transportation, <laughs> which I looked up because I know you have a lot of people who are driving out there. Um, uh, and while he... Uh, so I was captivated by that. I thought it was incredibly relevant to the time of the 70s, where, which were also a time of economic crisis, uh, it's hard to find a time in my lifetime when there hasn't been, uh, because in my view, we've abandoned the core ideas of Alexander Hamilton and those who followed him to build our country. Uh, in particular, I guess I would point to Lincoln uh, and FDR, which is unusual. Mo many people think they're the they're the exact opposites. Uh, but I think if you look at the book and you look at the principles, you see that the protection of the country against predatory interests, be they internal, out to external, uh, was, and for prosperity for everyone, uh, was very much uh, at the core of the ideas. So, sadly, I thought many people don't, with the revival and the musical, and I great. I was so happy that young people were reading Hamilton again and so forth and so on. Uh, I nonetheless thought that the economic dimension was really, and its relevance was really missing. And therefore, I got this book out. Um, and it's been a long time. I've, I've read all his works and many other works, but not, of course, everything. Uh, Chair now I enjoyed. Uh, but I thought the particular angle of particular relevance is these economic principles, which people have to become familiar with again today. You know, it's interesting, too. One of my uh, David Brooks once wrote, he was talking about uh, deep in the midst of the 2008-2009 crisis, the economic crisis that, of course, ignites the, the long recession 
as it has now become to be known as it moves further into the rearview mirror. He actually, as a way of complimenting Hamilton, he was kind of, you know, kind of dismayed at the paralysis of what was going on in the slow kind of stagnant climb out of the economic doldrums. And he said, I didn't understand why it happened, because um, it was the most talented group of people at the Treasury since Alexander Hamilton did the job by himself. (laughs) And and I just love the idea. A lot of people understand that literally what you have in Hamilton, and a lot of people don't understand this, was, you know, Bernard Barouche has the great line about the American system of government where he calls it to begin the world anew. And that enough of a system of government existed in the first place that the revolution had already happened in many ways, that the, the fighting right. was merely a kind of a you know, a a kind of exclamation point to a system of government that had been developing for 100 plus years. But the one place that they didn't have any experience was at the federal level in regards to economics. They had legislative models, but you literally have 13 different states, some of which are incredibly slave oriented, some of which are mercantile oriented, some of which, you know, are as close to free trade as the world could have at that time. And Hamilton, as you point out, has to somehow get everybody on the same economic page, and it's one of the great early debates of, of this country, correct? Can you, kind of, can you kind of lay out a little bit for us what it is, his economic vision, and what you kind of lay out in Hamilton versus Wall Street? Because I do think there's a good connection between Hamilton, Lincoln, and FDR, is that they literally saved the predators from themselves. That they did, as well as the rest of us. Um, I, I think that the... I mean, my the book is written as a polemic against a lot of misconceptions, uh, as opposed to trying to be didactic. Right? Uh, I was trying to to really get into people's misconceptions, you know. And many the primary misconception I saw was that even the supporters of Hamilton identified him totally with a financial system as opposed to a nation-building system. So the core of Hamilton, in my view is that here he is, you know, he spends seven years in the war, right? He, you know, he, he's with Washington on looking at the entire strategic situation, internationally and nationally. And he's looking at where the vulnerabilities are. And the vulnerabilities, he, calls, he says, we're not going to deal, we're not going to resolve the vulnerabilities and the, the tensions that are pulling us apart without an economic cohesion for this country that's coming into being. I mean, I agree with you. The revolution in the mind was going on for quite some time. Um, but the So he starts studying in the course of the war uh, economic work, and it's not just English economic work. It's also French economic work, Swiss economic work. And, of course, economics then was not economics now. It was not economics, uh, you know, as a special discipline. It was part of political philosophy because people saw economics as a subsidiary to creating prosperity for the country. So Hamilton's primary thought was that you needed to have increased the productive power of your population. And how do you do that? You can't do it without public credit because you don't want money to sit around. I mean, you don't want to amass gold. You want to put wealth to work, building things, growing things, as, uh, unfor- you know, this is a common phrase these days. Um, and therefore, he, you know, worked at a system which would create that public credit, the National Bank, um, and then he said, and when everything that I see, the only way you're going to get a sustainable growing nation is you have to have manufacturers with your agriculture. He's not replacing uh, agriculture with manufacturers. And you've got to invest in, in uh, what's necessary to make that thrive. You've got to have certain industries available. You've got to have transportation. You've got to have credit and you, and that will pull the nation together as a harmonious whole. And, and by the way, um, I'm going to take a quick break here. Uh, Nancy and I will continue our conversation on the other side of this. I'm going to let Sydney know to open the phones at 615-292-1111. Um, 
six three six six. But what I wanted to kind of also touch on is that one of the things, and I'll ask the question, and you can think about it over the break, is the other thing is too is that you know Jefferson often is kind of pointed to as the kind of great Democrat, but in many ways he also stands for landed interest, you know the vast accumulation of uh, property and land, and. And from what my understanding is, is that Hamilton sees that as a threat because vast accumulations of land are like sitting on giant hunks of gold. There's a real danger there. And that the bank, in many ways, becomes a bulwark against that, that there becomes, you know, a real kind of counterparty to that sort of accumulated wealth can exist in the idea of a more credit equitable society. We'll take a quick break here with Nancy. She'll tell me if I'm onto something here or if I'm completely off the chart. We'll be right back with uh, Revolution Row with the Journal of the American Revolution. Rather than tell them to talk to your lawyer, let them know you're a member of Driver's Legal Plan. With deep roots in the transportation industry, Driver's Legal Plan protects your company by protecting your drivers. It's a job they've been doing for 30 years. By eliminating unnecessary traffic convictions, they improve safety profiles, keep insurance costs low, and ultimately enhance driver retention. You do the driving, they do the talking, and together you keep your business safe, profitable and compliant. Call 800-580-8789 or go to driverslegalplan.com. Seen a lot of sunrises on the highways or rises and we ain't no stranger to that open road. Keep a tape of Dave Dudley singing coffee, 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 screaming from the speakers of my stereo. After 33 years of history, Nastic has realized that the most profitable and safest business model in long-haul trucking is the one truck entity. If that's you, Nastic membership is a great first step to fulfilling your small trucking American dream. NASTC, the National Association of Small Trucking Companies, continues to offer the finest benefits and programs ever offered to the small over-the-road company, even ones with only one truck. And they cover all the bases, from the best in-class Quality Plus fuel program to health and well-being with Help MD, the Mystic Driver app, and more. Nastic, putting the small company on top. Nastic.com. N-A-S-T-C dot com. Or call 800-264-8580. We're going east-west routes combined. It's a service from Radio Nemo of North America. It's designed to keep you safe and keep you informed as you listen to Revolution Road with the Journal of the American Revolution. Interstate 10 at Milton, it's 81 and misty. On 20 in Mesquite, it's 78 with moderate rain. Terrell and Barksdale Air Force Base both have light rain. Temperatures right around 80. 30, Greenville is 79 and light rain. Texarkana, 80. Little wind out of the northeast, light rain there as well. 44 at Joplin, 70, light rain. Springfield, 70, light rain. Southeast winds touch 10. Fort Leonard Wood, moderate rain. Over on 80 at Fairfield, 55. Southwest winds 15 going on 30. It's fair. That's the basic forecast for that place all the time. Kearney, 69. Southern winds 5, but they gust up to 31 with a few high clouds. 90. Sulphur Springs, 81. Moderate rain. Light rain at Camp Douglas. We're at 66. The Dells are 66. Southwest winds 15 going on 20. Heavy rain. Finally, 94. Camp Douglas, as I said before, 66. 93% humidity and light rain. The Dells is southwest winds at 20. Still stand with its heavy rain. Drive carefully over there. East-west routes combined. Service from Radio Nemo of North America, and now back to Revolution Road. And now back to Revolution Road with the Journal of the American Revolution. Nancy, before we get to our call, um, did you get a chance to uh, tell me I'm wrong? No, you're right. I mean, I, I would put it slightly differently. Uh, Jefferson did see as the bank as a threat uh, to the system that he was wedded to, which was a... Uh, a, a plantation-based oligarchical-run system. People think of him as being this great Democrat. I mean, he talked a good game, but, I mean, I've looked 
for example, into his particular role in Virginia and say when it comes to something which is absolutely essential as a democratic principle today, mass education, right? Jefferson went against mass education in favor of having the University of Virginia as a priority because he was committed to going from the top. And that is was absolutely different from the what is considered Hamilton's policy party, the Federalist Party. They were fighting for mass education as early as the 1820s. Um, that was defeated by Jefferson personally, and we didn't have mass education, public education in Virginia until 1870. Uh, after the war. So it's just a small example of the kind of thing. Hamilton's policy required for productive powers of labor education. He actually had a board that he wanted to set up with surplus funds in Washington that would promote science uh, development and the education and the arts. So, I mean, this guy was was looking at... um, so, So Jefferson was virulent against the bank because he thought it was a threat to that economic system and cultural system uh, that he was totally wedded to. Yeah, and it's interesting, too, because um, people, you know, they always think of Hamilton as this kind of highfalutin figure, and, you know, Jefferson is a man Not of the people. All. But the truth of the matter is it's, 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 a, it's a flip script is that, you know, um, all of those young men, with the exception of Lafayette, who kind of surround Washington are these hard scramble self-made boys you know the idea of they were big big fans of that that kind of i mean you could make a case that the tradition of horatio alger actually springs out of the hamiltonian model and absolutely you know and they love all of that kind of stuff the idea of these self-made men these autodidacts who don't come from anywhere who actually make themselves you know they really are americans in that way and the idea that they really it's that first kind of entrepreneurial can-do sort of spirit that if you just get if you stake me a little credit and take a chance on me, we can build some great stuff here as opposed to coming from the right families and the right people and the right amount of land as well. We got a phone call from uh, Pack Rat. He's given us a call from Ontario. Other people are calling as we speak. Hey, Pack Rat, tell Nancy good morning. Hey, good morning, Nancy. Uh, great to have yeah, you on the show. Uh, good. I'm glad to hear from you. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm, I'm going on a, a different track here. Uh, I'm getting a little bit more morbid. I want to talk to, uh, about his duel. Uh, According, to, I don't know who was it that that said this, or but uh, they they speculate that uh, in that duel Hamilton deliberately, I, I think he outdrew uh, Burr, but he deliberately missed because he didn't want to shoot him. But Burr did not show him that same consideration. Is there some truth to that? It's still a matter of great debate. There was definitely a hair trigger on Hamilton's um, gun. Uh, and there definitely was a shot that went into the air from Hamilton's gun, uh, I mean, into a tree high above Burr. Um, whether uh, ha- It is true that Hamilton said that he didn't intend to shoot. Um, uh, it could be that he accidentally shot Wild, uh, but for sure my view is that Burr was interested in killing and eliminating Alexander Hamilton from the political scene. He was a threat to Burr's political future. Ironically, uh, killing him uh, also destroyed Burr's political future, (laughs) Um, personally anyway. Um, So that's what I know. Yeah, the moment, and Nancy, is it fair to say the moment that Hamilton missed, regardless of his reasonings for miss, what Burr does next effectively dooms him from a PR standpoint? Because yes. it becomes very, e- Pack it goes back to your point, it becomes very easy to read that as like, they could spin that one regardless of what really happened that day, as what were you thinking? It's a disaster for him. It is, it basically, it's what ends up sending Burr to the Mississippi River for the disaster that follows. And it's kind of a, it's a great question. It's a great question. Anything else? No, that was it. I, I just, um, I guess it kind of, uh, from what I understand in, in history, duels really weren't all that popular even back then. It, it, uh, it was just, you know, two people with an attitude against each other. But uh, it, it, I think, would you agree that few, uh, few back, uh, duels back then were even frowned upon? 
Oh, yes. Uh, they were illegal in New York. That's why they went to New Jersey to do it. <laughs> um, <laughs> so it was all it was all over the place. Um, and, you know, philosophically, Hamilton said he was against duels. After all, his son was killed. His oldest son was killed in a duel oh. uh, simply three years before, uh, which devastated him. So people always, I mean, the the question that I hear often bandied about is, was it a death wish? Did he really, you know, why did he do this? But I think he felt that he really uh, wanted that this would be the end of Burr, one way or another. (laughs) And um, that he was, Burr was threatening the unity of the United States. Burr had run for governor of New York in order to split off a confederacy of the northern states with New York, with New England. And Hamilton was in a raging fight with the Federalist Party in New England against them collaborating with Burr and supporting him in the governor race in New York. Hamilton won. He succeeded in ensuring that Burr was defeated in that governor's race. And Burr was livid. Um, it, and... Uh, so Hamilton was absolutely convinced that Burr was a threat, not to himself, but to, as unfortunately everything is personalized in the in the musical and so forth. And so it's not a wasn't a personal issue. It's a question of the survival of the country, and that's I believe why Hamilton put his life on the line. You know, it's funny, by the way, uh, Nancy. The other interesting thing is that by the time we get to the end of it, Thomas Jefferson finally comes to see and understand exactly who Aaron Burr is at the end, too, when they end up down in Louisiana with General Wilkinson and that unfolding madness as well. Uh, Gore Vidal's input notwithstanding. I'm kind of with you on this. Pack Rat, great questions, man. I hope you have the best of days, and we'll talk this weekend, okay? Uh, I'm, I'm home this weekend. I'm, I'm doing some two wheel therapy this weekend. <laughs> oh, then I admire you deeply, man. Get some ride on you. Are you taking uh, Lady Packrat? Uh, yeah, Mrs. Packrat's coming with me. <laughs> all right. Well, have fun and enjoy the bike, okay, okay my friend? Okay. All, all the best. Okay. Thanks. Bye. Thank you, Packrat. It, it really is. And it, it kind of speaks, by the way, Nancy, his great question really speaks to how important the nation was, how much of Hamilton's own identity was wrapped up in the survival of this country, right? Absolutely. I mean, he bemoans that, right? He says, you know, no one has done more than me. I mean, it was true, actually. He said this in a private letter, but no one has done more than me to create the country, to save the country. And yet, you know, he's the one who's vilified by the Jeffersonian party, you know, and by certain uh, forces in New England to say that he's the threat, you know, he's the monarchist threat. In fact, he's just the opposite. It's it's interesting, too, because people don't understand the early part of the revolution continues after the revolution is over, that there are all kinds of movements for decades, uh, up until 1860, as a matter of fact, to keep on (laughs) splitting this in two. I mean, you know, the the idea is that, you know, we are going through something right now in regards to people saying this is irreconcilable. And I always say you should go check out 1968 and 1858 sometime to see what an irreconcilable. Right. (laughs) (laughs) To see what an irreconcilable country actually actually looks like uh we've been there before and we'll you know we'll be there again it's part of the ongoing argument nancy spanos joins us this morning it is great to have her on she is an expert on all things hamilton particularly the economic issues miles has given us a call from nevada we'll be talking uh to him on the other side of this as well we'll continue our conversation this is going as good as i hope nancy we'll be back after these messages And now, back to Revolution Road with the Journal of the American Revolution. Nancy Spanos and I were talking over the break about taking long walks in the crisp, cool air of the fall season. We're going to be talking about that all weekend as Dave Nemo Weekends falls into fall. A whole bunch of great guests, including some new additions to our Sleeper Cab Library. Don't forget Bruce Beeler, Smithsonian naturalist, will be joining us as well. It's the first Saturday of the month for natural encounters, hiking, biking, and just engaging with nature with our own friend, ornithologist Bruce Beeler, looking 
forward to that as well. Looking forward to your phone calls as we talk about apple cider and all kinds of fun stuff. But this morning, and what a fun day. Um, you know, she talks about the idea September 11th is the day that Hamilton sits behind the desk at the uh, well, the Department of Treasury. Um, by the way, the Department of Treasury was founded on this day. It's a great day to have Nancy, an expert on all things Hamilton, in particular, though, the economic theories and their application across, well, the 200-plus years of this history of this great country and how they've been used on more than one occasion to save the American economic system. Um, guys, you should check out her book, by the way. Um, it is so worth it. Um, the name of that book is Hamilton versus Wall Street, the core principles of the American system of economics, and it's available through all Internet book outlets. Hey, Nancy, good morning. Welcome back. I'm oh, glad to be back. Having a great time, Jimmy. Me too. We're going to talk to Miles, who's calling us from Nevada. Just want to say hi and glad to join the show. Hey, man. Good morning. Say hi to Nancy. Hi. Hi. Good hi, Nancy. How are you? Good. I'm fine. I hear you're from, uh, you were from New York originally? Uh, no, not originally, but I lived there 19 years, yeah. <laughs> I okay, went to school so I, there. I just got back. Oh, where'd you go to school? Uh, Columbia. Okay. I went to University right. yeah, of Columbia, I'm... and then I had okay, I met I my Columbia. husband and had my kids. You know, so I lived there for quite a while. Okay. So you a Brooklynite or oh, what? Just... Not uh, from the Bronx. Ah, okay. I'm I'm familiar with it. I'm well familiar with it, sir. <laughs> okay, I just got back. I was in New York a few weeks ago, and every time I go back to New York, I visit Hamilton's gravesite. Ah, yeah, I've been there many times for the it's, ceremony. It's, yeah, and that's because when I before I drove a truck, I worked for, uh, on a, in a company that had an office. My window faced uh, back at Trinity Church, and my window I could look out and see Hamilton's gravesite all day. And wow. uh, that's at the back of Trinity. Yeah, he's buried at Trinity Church. And right. um, what was interesting was any time um, I knew that area, that financial area very well. And I used to take girls on a, on a, you know, on a date and I would start early in the morning and we would visit Hamilton's grave, Trinity church. And I would show them wall street and uh, the federal reserve building and so on. So, you know what I noticed when I went to Hamilton's gravesite, I didn't see this before, or maybe I didn't remember, but this time people left a lot of, uh, money uh, coins on top of the flat gravestone at Hamilton site. You know where you know the one I mean. Oh, I know where exactly where you mean. I was there uh, a few weeks ago <laughs> at the uh, well, around okay. uh, around his death day. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I was I was there also a few weeks ago. So what I noticed was a lot of people left a lot of quarters, dimes, nickels, pennies. But what I did was, and I was wearing my New York hat, my New York Yankee hat, so I put my hat on top of uh, the gravesite, and Hamilton is on a $10 bill. But I put a $10 bill on Hamilton gravesite, and I took a picture <laughs> of it. So I, so I have a picture of my $10 bill on Hamilton. <laughs> okay. That's that's uh, something I I'm sure other people have left ten dollar bills there, but probably the church. Well, I was them. I was going to, but but I was going to, but not. I wasn't worried about somebody taking it. Well, maybe, but uh, it was a little windy. So. It was a little windy. Yeah, you don't need to have ten dollar bills flying around Wall Street. Miles, Miles, <laughs> Nancy, I have one quick question before we um before we have to let you go, Miles. Do you think that Hamilton? I mean, I know Hamilton would have loved baseball, but do you think he'd have been a Yankees or a Mets fan? I mean, be truthful, Miles. What do you think? Nah, he would have been a Yankees fan. Yeah, and then um, you know, you know, a couple of people I know that work at the bank, and they work at a bank, and they don't know who is on what ten, what what bill. So I always start with Hamilton. I said, look, the ten dollar bill is easier. Hamilton is on a ten. Hamilton. So they all know now that <laughs> Hamilton is on a ten dollar bill. Miles, and you're the I, best. <laughs> you're the best. Well, you know man. who first who first put him on a. a currency at all was was the Lincoln administration uh prior to that oh okay he wasn't on any kind of currency you know um but uh 
but they were the ones that did it because they realized that you needed the kind of credit system that he was uh, talking about in order to build up industry and build the country. So um, there's a, right. okay. a, a rationale there. It's a- Interesting topic. I wrote the I wrote the uh, name of the book Hamilton versus Wall Street. And where he's buried, it's funny. It's uh, Trinity Church behind Trinity Church. He's buried in in that cemetery, and it's uh, on one side is Wall Street, and on the other side is actually the American Stock Exchange. So you have the New York Stock Exchange on one side, and the American Stock Exchange right on the other side, and Hamilton is right in the middle. It's fantastic. Thank you, and I Miles. think, unfortunately, given what happens on Thank Wall you. Street these days, he might have turned over in his grave a few times. But that's okay. <laughs> that's a good Thank, you. Thank you, Miles. I think, by the way, that Hamilton is there keeping an eye on those guys. It really is yeah, kind of yeah, a... Yeah, I it, think so, too. Yeah. He, it's he really remarkable. Everybody needs to be watched. <laughs> <laughs> and that he's a big fan of the Panopticon. He likes the watcher watching the watched. I mean, he really was a big, big fan of checks and balances. I mean, part of, as we said earlier, the concern of the bank is actually not as this kind of, you know, Jackson loved to hide behind that and Jefferson did the idea that the bank is the enemy of the people, but you could make a case that Hamilton's response would be like, no, actually, you're the enemy of the people and you really don't like it when somebody sets up a system as powerful as you. You know, in many ways, they all speak for landed money and interest and the best way to stop landed money interest is providing those who want access to capital not having to go to those landed money interest and ask for their, you know, pittance at the table. It's a great point, though. You need a great segue in the middle of miles, and I'm going to give you a question to think about as we take our final break uh, of this half hour. Um, you, you talk about the idea about Lincoln and FDR, and, and in many ways Hamilton is always seems to be revived in moments of maximum ep- economic crisis when it comes to kind of saving the union. Um, can you – when we come back, talk about how both Lincoln and, to a large degree, both Roosevelt's in many ways see Hamilton as kind of a, a model for revitalizing capitalism in the country. We'll be right back with Nancy Spanos uh, after these messages. Still time at 615-292-6366. Getting the best of both worlds. Empty words? Yeah, usually. But then there's night transportation. Sure, night is a so-called mega fleet. But at the same time, night drivers enjoy the atmosphere of a small carrier. How? Well, the night cousins started a small company with the stated desire to become bigger, but at the same time stay small. Now, each of night's 27 terminals is like its own operation. So that way, night drivers reap the benefits that only a big carrier can provide, but it's like driving with a fleet of about 100 trucks or so. The best of both worlds. DriveNight.com. Visit DriveNight.com. We're always on a roll. Most trucking companies are hiring. So why should you consider a move to Creek Carrier or Schaefer Trucking? Just ask our drivers. You know, the miles are good, the people are great, the pay is great. 26 years, Creek has given me everything I need to be a successful truck driver. I can't thank them possibly enough. But I do just love this company, and so I don't mind talking about it at all. (laughs) Visit us at CreekCarrier.com or text pound 250, keyword Crete. And now, back to Revolution Road with the Journal of the American Revolution. We are back here in the final uh, 15 minutes or so of the Dave Demo Show on Sirius XM 146 Road Dog Trucking. Hamilton versus Wall Street, the core principles of the American system of economics. Uh, Nancy Spanos is uh, joining us this morning. Um, we're going to have her back at some point to talk about the book in more detail. But I did ask you a question before we hit the break. Uh, was it fair and can you explicate? Absolutely. You asked me, uh, well, you pointed out that in periods of economic crisis tends to be when Hamilton's ideas are taken up big time, particularly uh, the period of 
uh, the Abraham Lincoln administration and also the period of, you, know, you mentioned both Roosevelt's, but I would emphasize uh, the second Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt, because those are the periods where the country faced a bankruptcy situation similar to what Hamilton faced. After all, when he established his system, you know, the country was really not together yet, and it was totally bankrupt. Um, and there's various states were fighting each other. They were taxing each other. There was even a threat of, of physical war between Rhode Island and one of the other surrounding states. So this is... Uh, so when you hit a period of of bankruptcy, which is what Lincoln faced when he came into office, he lost all the revenue from the South and the tariffs and all that, and then and uh, FDR total bankruptcy. You know you have to reorganize your economy and you look at what is wrong and then what positively you have to do and you have to provide credit to get production going again. You will never pay all that debt unless you are producing anything, um, and that is what. Uh, Hamilton's ideas and credit system allowed uh, to happen at the beginning and allowed to happen under uh, Lincoln and FDR in particular. Uh, to And they increased our productivity. They invested in, uh, for example, FDR, the investment in electricity in rural America, you know, transformed the productivity of this country. Um, and, you know, not to mention many other aspects of, of what was done in order to put us at the top globally for a while uh, until we abandon those ideas. Could you make a case, and I'm, I, like I said, I'm actually, I'm genuinely asking these questions as opposed to giving you my thesis, that both the TARP program in the, um, in the aftermath of the, uh, the collapse uh, that happened in 2007, 2008, and then the PPP program with its with its very, very, very expansive forgiveness um, inside of uh, releasing credit for people to be able to pay their employees and all that kind of stuff, that those are both Hamiltonian, if not on the scale of both um, um, Lincoln's 1860 expansion and FDR's um, New Deal. Do those kind of uh, fall into the rubric there? I don't think so, because I think Hamilton would have put... Uh, I mean, I don't think they're antithetical, but I don't think they're, his priority would have been, excuse me, to get production going again with decent paying jobs. Put the money, I mean, the TARP program ended up bailing out the banks for the most part. Right. And the banks were supposed to put money into investment in the in capital expansion. And they did not. I mean, as you prob undoubtedly are aware, and your readers, your listenership is aware. I mean, masses amounts of money have gone into speculation, have gone into buying back stock values and building up the stock market and so forth. They've not gone into building our infrastructure. I mean, any trucker going across the country is totally aware of that. So, the uh, fact is that he would have move to tie the issuance of low interest credit to expanding your physical growth uh with i mean and yes you would need to have uh l relatively lenient terms you'd have to have low interest the reconstruction finance corporation which was like a hamiltonian bank under fdr did that i mean they loaned they didn't grant uh they loaned on uh you know but, and they were mostly paid back. I mean, the Reconstruction Finance Corporation made a profit. <laughs> um, and it pro allowed all kinds of businesses all over the country. And it also was directed to provide money for government projects. Uh, and, which... and Okay, so if I'm hearing you correctly, and like I said, I want to make sure I am, because like I said, I genuinely asked as opposed to having a theory. So if I'm understanding you that in regards to TARP, the problem is not so much the action, but that it came with no strings and no mandate to then take the money in regards to the bank bailout and make that money available to the people of the United States, that they instead took the money and paid down their own debts and did stuff to reinvest in themselves rather than invest in the American economy. And that is yeah. in many ways so that something like the bipartisan infrastructure bill, which just passed, would be something more in regards to Hamilton might have approved of that more because he more, would, more. yeah more it's much too small i mean the uh 
and in fact, it needn't have been uh, funded the way it's funded. Um, there's actually, you know, if if I can mention, uh, Jimmy, that I have a blog uh, in addition Please. to the book. Uh, it's called American System Now. American System Now. Um, and if you put that in, americansystemnow.com, you will find I've been running this since the summer of 2017. Um, and you will find uh, a lot on Hamilton. You will find a lot on Lincoln. You will find you know, some on Grant, <laughs> whom you've mentioned, uh, and uh, John Quincy Adams and others. But you will also see that there is today a proposal for a new Hamiltonian-style bank called a National Infrastructure Bank, which there's a bill in Congress. It has eight, 16 sponsors, 18 sponsors, and so forth, which the way that it's funding is like Hamilton did with the initial bank and the second bank. He took the debt of, that the government already had, made it into bonds, and those bonds became the capital basis for the bank. So you didn't have to borrow in order to capitalize your bank. You're asking you the country already, to you're invest. You're taking the money you already you're taking money already you, that you'd already borrowed. You're, you're asking your private citizens who now are creditors of the government, right? Um, to invest in building the country. And you're making it a profitable thing for them. And then it's a profitable thing for the country uh, because you get something out of it. Hamilton makes that point over and over and over again. When people are complaining, for example, that foreigners were investing in the Bank of the United States, they say, he said, well, they don't have a vote, number one. And number two, they're investing their money, which we're using to build something that lasts. <laughs> and we're not, they're not just coming in and ripping us off. Um, are you going to object if someone invests our money to build something that actually lasts and improves your life? You know, no. So anyway, that there is a proposal now for a Hamiltonian style bank, which repurposes debt that is already done. You know, it eliminates this whole, you know, we can't have more debt question. We already have the debt. <laughs> uh, Ham we had the debt when the country was established. And Hamilton, we couldn't pay the debt. So Hamilton paid the international interest, but then he said, let's reorganize this debt, make bonds, and those bonds, when you invested in the Bank of the United States, three-quarters of the investment had to be in bonds, government bonds. So you were putting government credit to work behind private industry, not controlling private industry, but making the credit available to private industry and local governments to be able to build the country. And um, I would encourage people to look into that as the kind of thing. And the, the proposal that's in Congress is $5 trillion worth. I mean, after all, we have, what, over $17 trillion worth of government debt? I don't know how much it is. But the... Uh, could actually begin to make a huge dent in our infrastructure deficit, which we've underpaid into for um, for obvious, you know, for many reasons over the past number of decades. Yeah, and uh, by the way, it's a big one, though. I mean, I, you know, one of the good news is, is the fact that for the first time, uh, it looks like we're going to be building some roads and bridges. Uh, in the last moment here, um, in manufacturers, he does, as you pointed out, talk about. Um, uh, his view of infrastructure. Can you give us a brief summary of that? And then we'll have you on some other time to talk more in detail about other stuff. Uh, what, what's Hamilton's feeling on infrastructure? He says it's absolutely critical to building manufacturers. Um, it's been shown internationally. Um, one place where he agrees with Adam Smith. Um, and that this is a matter that there should actually, he said, be a comprehensive national plan because you need to have the, the states collaborate. This is in the re, uh, report on manufacturers near the very end. Um, it is, uh, uh, I don't know, you can't, you could look it up under, um, it's called, uh, I got it just so that I would be able to, it's, 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 
number 11, the facilitating of the transportation of commodities. Um, oh, I like that. We're going to call That's going to be the name of my new show, The Facilitation of okay. the Transportation of Commodities. <laughs> By the way, Nancy Spanos has joined us this morning, uh, Revolution Road. Guys, I'm going to say it again because uh, it needs to uh, be said. Let me tell you one more time to please go online everywhere that ebooks are sold. Uh, please check out Hamilton versus Wall Street, the core principles of the American system of economics. It's available through all Internet book outlets. Nancy, I made you a promise we're going to get you on for a weekend show to talk about the book in particular as well. We're going to make that work out. I'll talk to Meredith. We'll get that set up. Have the best of weekends and go beat that heat, you okay? Too. You too. As And I, I really enjoyed it, Jimmy. Really enjoyed well. it. Thank you so much. Nancy Spanos, of course, by the way, Hamilton versus Wall Street. So worth checking out. Uh, what a great time we had this morning.